Okay, uh, this is some work done with uh, Dietmar Eggman and uh, Robin Wanhara, both of ARM. Uh, I don't know if they made it here today. If they did, uh, that's even better. Uh, we did a little bit of work on energy efficiency on asymmetric processing, multiprocessing systems. And this, of course, means the ARM's big dot little architecture. We'll be talking about a little bit overview of what that is. How many people have, uh, are, are familiar with the big dot little architecture? Okay, a fair number are, but it looks like some aren't, so we'll, we'll go through that. Uh, talk about the energy efficiency strategy, review some of Morton's earlier work we based this on, and then uh, talk about uh, what we did to make things work a little bit better. All right, so one way of looking at big dot little is as a continuation of voltage frequency scaling by other means. And uh, the problem is if you have a given set of transistors, if you reduce the voltage and frequency below a certain point, your uh, energy efficiency doesn't improve because there's leakage current on the transistors and that sets a floor to the current draw. And uh, that means beyond a certain point you have to reduce the number of transistors. Uh, on the other hand, you need the full complement of transistors if you want good performance. The solution ARM came up with is to actually have two sets of CPUs. And they have the Cortex-A15, which is the big CPU, which they always have in lower case like that. Um, uh, and they have deep pipelines and many functional units. These are optimized for performance. Cortex-A7 is the little set, which they always capitalize again. And these have short pipelines, few functional units, and thus fewer transistors, which allows them to get better energy efficiency. There's two basic configurations. There's a big dot little switcher where you essentially, as you decrease the voltage and frequency on the big CPU, you get to a point where you can't decrease it anymore, and you switch to the little CPU. And that's, uh, that's not the focus of this talk. That's uh, another group worked on that. We're looking at uh, big dot little MP. And uh, what the deal is there is the Linux kernel actually sees all the CPUs, both the big and the little, at the same time. And uh, that actually works reasonably. Um, the kernel applications see them. And it also allows any combination of big and little CPUs to be used concurrently. And that means that you can have a workload where it needs one CPU running at full performance and maybe several other running uh, more efficiently. So we've got hardware now. Um, I'm not sure how far along that's gotten, but uh, the results in this paper were actually generated on real hardware with real energy measurements as opposed to simulated, modeled, or uh, estimated. Um, there is a little bit of application awareness we'll see in this. Uh, test workloads is something being worked on. Uh, CPU hot plug, I'm sure, is going to introduce some in fun in here. We're talking mostly, uh, in the review, we'll be talking mostly about some small scheduler mods that Morton did. And then we'll be talking about some small kernel mods, um, or actually abuse of previous kernel modifications uh, for the use of power efficiency. It's always abuse when you do it the first time, as near as I can tell. So this is kind of a pictorial diagram of a big dot little system. And this, uh, the numbers of CPUs can vary. Uh, this particular example has two big ones and three little ones. Uh, the big ones, again, are for performance. They run twice as fast. A given set of instructions will run roughly twice as fast on a big CPU as it will on a little CPU. On the other hand, a given set of instructions will run about three times more energy efficiently on the small CPUs. In other words, if you had a uh, workload that consumed, let's say, one milliwatt hour on the big CPUs, it would consume one third of a milliwatt hour for that same instructions getting the same work done on the little CPUs. So this suggests a fairly straightforward strategy for mobile workloads. Uh, but first, let's take a, you know, the problem we have here is that the kernel assumes that all the CPUs are similar. And if you leave it to itself, it'll run stuff wherever it wants to without understanding the difference in, in performance and the difference in energy efficiency. So that's the uh, thing that needs to be addressed. This is a schematic of the system that was actually tested. So the system that was under test had two each of the little and the big cores. Uh, the types of cores shared an L2 cache, and there's an inherent interconnect with the interrupt controller uh, I.O. and uh, memory ports, as you'd expect. So that's kind of what the hardware we actually use in these experiments. So what strategy would you use? If you're doing a mobile workload where your main concern is battery lifetime, 
what you want to do is run a little CPUs by default. Unless you have a very good reason, you want to keep the big CPUs off at all times. Now, you have to run the big CPU sometimes. If you have some sort of uh, workload, it might be a game, it might be some kind of video processing or whatever, that requires more power than little CPUs can give you, in order to get the user experience to be what it needs to be, you're going to have to run on the big CPUs. In other words, you run on little CPUs when you can, and you run on the big CPUs only when you need to, to preserve user experience. So big CPUs might be used for media processing, rendering, and uh, this also suggests something about RCU callbacks, and we'll talk about what that is in a moment. You want them to run the little CPUs, and that might also be the case for timers and other asynchronous events. Um, and we'll take a look about what that means a little bit later. So the key point, unlike normal SMP systems, where all the CPUs are created equal, here we want to distribute the task unevenly, not evenly, but unevenly, based on what task needs what kind of processing and what the battery lifetime needs are. Uh, and in particular, unlike standard SMP, it really matters now where you put a task. You can't just assume all the CPUs are the same. Okay, let's take a look at some work Morton did a year or so ago. And uh, here we took a, he took a uh, Android render time, execution time. And if you had four big CPUs, so instead of having two each of Cortex-A15s and Core-7s, if you had four Cortex-A15s, you get something looking like this. The time required to do the rendering is at about 10 to 10 and a half seconds, and it's very uniform. Things happen very predictably. On the other hand, if you take the stock system, the stock scheduler, don't tell it anything, and hand it two weak CPUs and two strong CPUs, you end up with something like this. I mean, the best case is nice, it's down about 10 seconds, but there's a big tail, and if you run everything on the little CPUs and don't use the big ones, life is pretty hard here. Okay, we're running up, up to 17 seconds, almost twice as long. That's clearly not a good thing, and we'd like to make it work better. So what Morton did was take a, uh, a different approach to it. He bases on Paul Turner's entity load tracking systems. Uh, interesting timing there. And uh, the idea is to run the tasks on little cores, as I said before, unless the task load is below a, above a fixed threshold and the task priorities default are higher. In other words, if we have tasks that the Android stack has said are high priority, and the load of that task is high enough, in other words, we have an important task that's consuming a lot of CPU, then we run it on the big CPU. Otherwise, in all other cases, we run on the little CPUs. <clears throat> so what he did was he set up a big, little, big and little SCED domains without load balancing. And then when a long-running high-priority task wakens, one's on a big core, and you period periodically check for high-priority tasks transitioning into the long-running high-load state. And in that case, you'd migrate them from the little CPUs to the big CPUs. And when he did that, he ended up with performance that actually rivaled that of having all big cores, despite having only two big cores. So uh, this spike here, the red, is the old four-core S&P. And then we had this blue that was the uh, naive situation where the scheduler just ran things forever. And by using that heuristic, he took this and put it so that the spike almost is exactly the same as a four-core S&P, despite the fact we've only got two fast CPUs and we have two slow CPUs. So we get roughly the same performance, but with quite a bit of energy savings. Not quite uh, half energy savings, but close to it, you'd expect. So that worked out pretty well, and that was a good thing. And we base what I'm described next on that work. So we start with Morton's situation with the scheduler, and then we're going to make some more modifications and look at what more improvement we can get on top of that. All right. Um, we picked on RCU. Um, there's a URL if you want to get uh, more information on it. For this pre presentation, all you have to know is that RCU is something that makes work happen later. So it's kind of like timers in the sense that you take a function call, essentially, and schedule it to happen at some time in the future. Now, what happens is that uh, 
Each callback is a, it's just a callback with function pointer argument. There's per CPU lists. If you make things wait a little longer than you have to, that's okay. Not a problem, really, to delay a little bit. But um, if you do it too soon, that's really bad. You have silent memory corruption, you'll have a system crash, and it'll be really hard to debug. And the point of it is it allows extremely fast and scalable read-side access to data structures. Okay, so basically it's just a way of deferring things. In short, really, it's a way of procrastinating. This is tapping the awesome power of procrastination for over two decades now. Now, procrastination is a wonderful thing. Um, if you're like me, you like to do it. Uh, but there's one big drawback for it. It has a dark side. And that dark side is sooner or later, you've got to do the work. Okay? I mean, it doesn't go away. You kind of get a short-term loan of time. And the problem is, if we're running on a big CPU, we woke up and did some work over here, and then sometime later, we wake up the CPU to do this callback, which is not time critical at all. There's no reason to run on a big CPU. So we're chewing up three times the power we have to for no good effect. All right? And that's not particularly helpful. So we'd like to improve that. And there's two ways. And these aren't things that I developed for big dot little. They were just mechanisms that were there for other purposes that looked like they might help, so we tested them. One of the things that I did for real time, um, not for energy efficiency, was to offload RCU callbacks. And in this case, in other words, you have a CPU that's producing the callbacks, but instead of executing them on the CPU that scheduled them, you execute them on some other CPU. Obviously, if a big CPU, you'd want to execute them on a little CPU. So that's one approach. Another approach is to use something that was actually was designed for energy efficiency, but for SMP systems, which is RCU fast no hertz. And the idea here is that you attempt to make the CPU drain its RCU work before going idle, thus cutting down on the number of scheduling clock interrupts. And we'll, I'll show some diagrams of how these things operate in the next couple slides. So this is the base case. This is what happens if we don't do anything. I'm just showing one big CPU and one little CPU here for simplicity. So the big CPU was busy, it did some work, and it's part of that work it posted an RCU callback, which has to be executed at a later time over here. And while that's happening, it has to take scheduling clock interrupts to allow RCU to push its way through the state machine and find out, okay, when is it okay to do this work? And at this point, it decides to do it. So this is really bad because not only do we do, do the work up here where it's expensive, but we also took these scheduling clock interrupts, waking the CPU up repeatedly every jiffy or so. Again, consuming quite a bit of extra power. So this is, this is what would happen by default, and it has some energy efficiency problems. Now, if we do the callback offloading, what happens instead is that uh, this guy does the call RCU, but it's offloaded to the little CPU. That means the little CPU now is taking the scheduling clock interrupts and also executing the callback. Now, this isn't coming for free. Uh, we're taking twice as long to do the callback. And this piece of work here, if we go back and forth between the slides, you can see it actually gets delayed. So if we go up here, you can see, that wasn't too far. OK, so if you look at the busy on the far right there, it moves over a little bit. It got delayed because we were doing the callback then when it wanted to do something else. So, but on the other hand, we're paying a third the power consumption for this piece of work and for these scheduling clock interrupts, and that should result in some savings. There's a little bit of extra work involved in offloading the callback, but uh, that's a trade-off. We'll see how it works. The second approach is to use the RCU Fathno Hertz, and there's several things that can happen here. One is that it might figure out that it can just do the callback immediately and not have to sleep and wake up. We'll still pay the energy cost for doing the callback, but we won't have to do the sleep and wake up. The other thing that happens is if we do have to push the state machine, we do it less frequently. So before we had a whole bunch of scheduling clock interrupts across that line up there. We had like seven of those red things. Now we're down to one. We only do every fourth tick. And the reason is, is that it knows that all it's doing is the RCU, so it sets up the tick for that alone. Now, that means that this callback was delayed. It would have been right here, but it had to wait for the next jiffy, so it's right here a little bit. So we're paying a latency penalty, a little bit of one, 
but it's the latency penalty is normally just freeing memory, so we usually don't care. So those are two approaches. Going back again, one of them is to move the processing to the cheaper CPU, given that the processing is not time critical, and it's a lot cheaper in energy. And the second one is to do less work to do the processing, to omit the scheduling lock error up summit. Um, how do I detect the little CPU? In other words, how do I decide up here where to put this thing? Um, RCU doesn't. I have to rely on whoever's setting the system up to take the offloaded K threads and, and bind them to the appropriate set of CPUs. Like um, uh, RCU. Um, there'd be, there might be something like that. Um, it's, uh, yeah, you just... You're just taking K thread. Basically, I just produce a K thread per CPU, and I don't know where you want to run them, so I just let them run anywhere. In, in fact, in fact, I think that if you look at the way Morton's thing works, I'm, I may be confused here. But if I remember correctly, if you just leave them unbound, but you're using Morton's changes, I believe it'll recognize them as not having much load. And therefore, I think it automatically puts them on the little CPUs. Um, I'm sorry, you were? Yeah, we could, we could uh, have it tell it. But the, the, thing, is, the thing is, in this particular case, um, um, if, you're using, if you're using Morton's changes, it just ends up recognizing that the, that the work done on those K threads is very intermittent, and uh, is it, and then it's low priority, and so it just kind of binds them to the little CPUs automatically as well. You can, you can, you can, uh, you can take and say which CPUs you want to run on, um, or you can, I think you can do task set or which or or any number of other things um, after the system's up. You can move them around later if you want. Um, I just make them and. And you guys have to, have to say where you want them. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is a little bit of an eye chart. I apologize for the people in the back. What we're doing here is we're running a bunch of different uh, workloads that are in some way related to uh, mobile workloads. Cyclic test is really kind of a uh, real-time workload that's been kind of purposed over just because it has low intensity which matches a number of mobile workloads. Uh, Sysbench, uh, Andy, the AndyBench are Android ones, and of course audio is related to uh, uh, media players, so that's where those came from. So what we have here is we have uh, pairs of energy and time. So we want energy to be conserved, but we don't want to, these things to take a huge amount more time. We, we'd like this to get better and this not to change much would be kind of an ideal thing. So this is the reference amount. So we have the amounts of energy which varied based on the benchmark and the amount of time consumed. And then we've got option one here, which is offloading the callbacks, these four columns. And then option two, uh, the RCU fast no hertz, reducing the amount of work required over here. And uh, we've got the energy and the time again, just like over there. But we also have a benefit, which is a percentage improvement compared to the base case in all of these. As you can see, there's uh, you know, a double-digit improvement up here, and there's also some big single-digit improvements. And if you look over here, um, at the time consumed, there's not much happening. I mean, they're all fairly small, um, a little bit of degradation, a little bit of improvement, depending. On the, the thing that surprised me is that the enforced idle, the RCU fast node hertz approach, actually did better in a number of cases. It has uh, over 20% here, and a couple of them that are in, uh, in the 10% range. Of course, um, this raises a question, uh, what happens if you do both? And unfortunately, the answer is not much. You see, you don't get to save the same energy twice, or, or it doesn't, you don't get to count it. Right? <laughs> it's just two different ways to save the energy, and, and if you've saved, it's saved. Uh, if we, you guys can work out a way to save the energy twice, you know, that's a, a really cool thing, and let me know how you do it, because that'd be really helpful. <laughs> it goes against thermodynamics, you know, but you know, thermodynamics is strictly empirical, there's no, uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> they say this law of conservation of energy, but they just, you know, it's just that they haven't seen it violated, right? 
Sorry. <laughs> Third law of thermodynamics. Let's see. If, let's see. If remember, let's see if remember them. The first law is that energy conserved, and uh, translated, that means uh, you can't win. <laughs> the second law of thermodynamics is the entropy always in, of a closed system always increases, and uh, translated, this. Okay. It's, uh, well, uh, maybe they number them differently in different uh, education systems. I don't know. <laughs> Mother Nature doesn't care how we number them, right? Uh, the second law that I was, as I was taught, the second law is that the entropy of a closed system always increases. And translated, this means you can't break even. The third law of thermodynamics is no finite sequence of, of operations can reduce the temperature of, of a real object to absolute zero. Translated, this means you can't get out of the game. So there you have it. You can't win, you can't break even, you can't get out of the game. Here we are. The real world for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, let me get the first approach here and make sure we, we're talking about the same first approach. You're talking about the base case or are you talking about the offloading? This case. Okay, the, uh, the tick is, is needed because uh, RC was a state machine and it goes through states at various times to work out when it's okay to execute this stuff. And the scheduling talk, clock tick is what's driving the state machine. Paul. Well, um, we didn't get a chance to really profile to that detail. My suspicion is, see, what's happening is that, is that putting this on the other CPU is not free. You're taking cache misses and things like that to kick it over. And I think what happens is by the time you, well, let's go over to the next example. By the time you reduce the energy consumption to a scheduling talk tick and a callback, I think you get to the point where the, where the cache line movement is, is taking as much energy. I mean, this is probably is not to scale. I don't think, I think the scheduling clock ticks are about as big as the callbacks, actually. <laughs> so, uh, but as near as I can tell, that's, that's what's happening. We're, we're paying um, about as much at that point for shifting the thing over as we're saving by the remaining stuff that we haven't gotten rid of. Um, I, um, I, Morton was actually there when it was happening. I just got that they sent the data around the world to me. <laughs> but TC2 apparently is what they used. Okay. So anyway, the, what we ended up with, I was surprised, the enforced idle or the fast no hertz actually performed a little bit better, but it kind of depends on, the, on which benchmark you use. You can find examples either way. Um, combining them doesn't help. They both provide real benefits. And uh, it turns out that they're both needed for other reasons anyway. It's not like we're going to throw one or the other out because of the energy efficiency because they had other reasons why both of them are needed. Uh, offloading is for real time and for high performance computing applications, you know, the big heavy number crunching applications to reduce OS jitter and thereby increasing throughput. And the enforced idle works fairly well by now for, for SMP energy efficiency. One interesting thing to speculate about, I probably won't get time to push on this myself, is that there are other things that get deferred, like timers and work queues and who knows what else. And it... Oh. Did it help? So uh, Viresh Kumar, yeah, uh, did, apparently has done a patch that I missed um, where they migrate the work queues. In other words, you do a schedule work on, one, on a big CPU, it'll actually have the work happen on a little CPU. Uh, would, and so that, that sounds like a good step forward. So looks like we're making progress on, 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 progress on this already. Yeah. I haven't. Um, uh, the uh, question was whether we've looked at uh, combining timer slack with offloading. Uh, and I guess that means uh, trying to offload the timer and also use timer slack. Yeah. Let you group, group a bunch of them together. Yeah. And so one question, I guess the question would be whether it's better to do timer slack and keep it on the big CPU or better to offload it to the little CPU and not do timer slack or whether it's better to do both. <laughs> Is there any progress on that? Mm-hmm. 
Okay, we didn't do that as part of this work, but um, it's cer certainly something that would be a good thing to look at in the timers there. Okay, and so that's, uh, that was the results. We actually, I was surprised. I expected it to be single digits at best. We actually got 20% in some cases. Um, so it's worth going after, and it's there. You can, it's already in the kernel, been for a while, so configuration is easy. This is the usual slide sponsored by IBM Legal. And uh, if we got more questions, I can take them on. Otherwise, uh, go to our next uh, presentation. Yes? Where'd four come from? Why four? Why not five? Why not seven? <laughs> Why not two? Nine's a lucky number. Uh, what, hap what it is is that uh, it's just an observation that grace periods often take about, uh, let's see, about six ticks. So why four? Well, four is a nice binary number that's close to six, and, and it allows me to uh, do the rounding easily. So the thing is, is the thing is, is that if I just did four independently on, on CPUs in a package, it wouldn't help because they would be skewed from each other. Whereas if I take the Jiffy and whack the lower two bits off of it, um, then I can make all the packages line up as well. All the, all the CPs in the package line up as well so they wake up at the same time, do their thing, and go away. So it was mathematics was, was why, I guess. I could have divided by six, obviously, but um, um, I didn't want to do the... I, I like the idea of, of uh, whacking the bottom bits off better than doing the initial divide. Old-fashioned, probably just as fast on all the CPUs by now, I don't know. Other questions? If not, thank you very much for your time and attention, and uh, hand it off to the next speaker.